What distinguishes Broadcasting Scotland from a website or blog, apart from our brilliant programmes? Hi there, I'm Gordon Ross. Are the costs we face to enable us to produce those programmes? These costs are significant and ongoing. However, our facilities are able to do so much more if only we had the staff. In the last year, some of our supporters have cancelled their subscriptions. In one way, we would prefer it if it was because they didn't like us, rather than it being because of the financial pressures which we are all under because of COVID. The really positive outcome of our fundraiser is that at a time of economic challenge in Scotland, we will use your donations to create jobs and in a small way contribute to improving the Scottish economy. If you want us to be Scotland's independent broadcaster, able to provide an alternative mainstream television platform, then please support us. Scotland is going to be an independent country. Just imagine what we could do if we had even 1% of the BBC Scotland Channel's budget. Imagine. And then please consider turning your imagination into reality. Please support us if you can afford it. Good morning. Can I remind colleagues of the COVID-related measures and that face coverings should be worn while moving around the Chamber and the wider Holyrood campus? The next item of business is general questions. As ever, I would appreciate uh, succinct questions and answers to match. And I start with question number one, Pam duncan Glancy. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its plans for the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child in Corporation Scotland Bill. Minister Claire Hawhey. Uh, we remain committed to the incorporation of the UNCRC into Scots law to the maximum extent possible as soon as practicable. While the Supreme Court judgment means that the Bill cannot receive royal assent in its current form, we are urgently and carefully considering the most effective way forward for this legislation to ensure that incorporation can happen as quickly as possible with confidence that any amendment to the Bill do not attract further challenge. Our preference is to address the Supreme Court's judgment by returning the Bill to Parliament via the reconsideration stage. In parallel with planning for that, we are also exploring options for extending our powers to incorporate the UNCRC beyond those available under the current devolution settlement. The Deputy First Minister has shared a copy of his exchange with the Secretary of State about this in an update to the Equalities, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee. Pam Duncan Glancy. I, I thank the Minister for that answer. And next Wednesday will mark a year since the UNCRC bill was passed unanimously by the Scotch Parliament. I am concerned actually about the letter that the Minister refers to, because it suggests that in the reconsideration process, the Government are seeking further powers in order to make the bill competent, rather than working with the UK Government to make the bill competent within the powers it currently holds. Political point scoring over the Constitution by the Scotch Government has already delayed the bill, and it seems it will continue to do so. In the meantime, young people have no idea what timescale the Government is working to or how long the process will take. They need reassurance that the Government remain committed to the rights, their rights and to bringing the Bill within the Parliament's competence as soon as possible. And they deserve to know Question. when the UNCRC incorporation will be a reality. When will the Government bring back the Bill? Minister. Uh, I thank Pam Duncan Glancy for our further question. The Deputy First Minister has committed to keeping Parliament and the Committee updated in the progress of uh, progressing the Bill. However, I think it is really important to recognise that the majority of the work in relation to the implementation of the UNCRC is continuing at pace. Brief supplementary from Stephanie Callaghan, who joins us on, online. Make It Right is the aim of a campaign led by the young people of North Lanarkshire. It is encouraging other local children to better understand their rights. The young people have even created and started their own social media video. Can I ask what steps the Scottish Government is taking to involve young people themselves in raising awareness of children's rights ahead of incorporating the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child? Minister. As Scottish Government officials are due to meet North Lanarkshire Council later this month to learn more about the excellent project and how we can share good practice. 
The Scottish Government commissioned Young Scot and Children in Scotland to work with children and young people to develop resources to raise awareness of children's rights across all sectors. And the materials were published in September 2020 to coincide with the introduction of the UNCRC Bill to Parliament. There is also good work underway in schools. UNICEF's Rights Respecting School Awards provides a framework to embed the UNCRC strategically and practically into schools, ensuring awareness of children's rights among children and young people. And the Children's Parliament have also recently launched a complementary resource called Dignity in Schools, which aims to demonstrate ways in which primary schools can adopt a rights-based approach and help to make rights real for children. Thank you. And briefly, Willie Rennie. People get fed up when our two governments can't just sort things out, when it, especially when it comes to an issue of rights for children. We heard last week about the number of children locked up in prison when they shouldn't be. So this matter is real. Rather than hunting for a never-ending battle with the Conservatives, when will the government sort this out? We need a date. Minister. Uh, presiding officer, as I uh, gave my answer to Pam Duncan Glancy, the Scottish Government is working at pace at this, and the Deputy First Minister will write to the relevant committee and inform Parliament. Thank you. Question number two, Richard Leonard. On cooperative development in Scotland. Minister Ivan McKee. agencies to support the growth of cooperative and other alternative business models, which we know can deliver strong outcomes on fair work and benefits to local communities. The Scottish Government is determined to significantly increase the number of cooperatives, social enterprises and employee-owned businesses in Scotland while supporting regional regeneration and the wealth of local communities. In a recently published 10-year National Strategy for Economic Transformation sets our commitment to undertake and publish a review of how best to do that. Richard Lennon. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that answer? The Scottish Government has stated that its goal is the creation of 500 employee-owned businesses by 2030. In 2018, it set up a Scotland for Employee Ownership Group to achieve this. Cooperatives and employee ownership were mentioned again in last week's economic strategy. But the problem is this. The cooperative development team in Scottish Enterprise was dismantled. Scottish Enterprise acts the budget for cooperative awareness raising, grants support to cover 30% of the cost of the transaction to convert to a worker-owned business has been withdrawn. The Scotland for Employee Ownership Group has become little more than a ministerial photo opportunity. And as a result, Question, Scotland please. is not going up, it is going down the UK league table of worker ownership. When will the Scottish Government finally address this? Stop paying lip service, put in place a credible industrial strategy, back it with the resources it needs and show that it really is serious about cooperative development. Uh, thank uh, the member for the question. Um, just to clarify, Corporate Development Scotland is uh, the arm of Scottish Enterprise that works in partnerships with Highlands and Islands Enterprise and South of Scotland to support company growth through collaborative, cooperative and employee ownership. And in terms of uh, the number of businesses in that, uh, in that regard, um, the, Scotland continues to be ahead of uh, the rest of the UK with, uh, with regard to that. And, and obviously, we're focused right across the whole, uh, the, the whole alternative business model space, uh, including so, uh, social enterprises. And the member will be aware that uh, social enterprises, we doubled our funding to uh, almost two, years over, two million pound over three years to uh, support the activity that's happening in that regard. So resources are in place. Community corporate development Scotland continues to work as part of Scottish Enterprise uh, and the Scottish Government remains committed, as we have highlighted in the National Economic Strategy, to developing cooperative social enterprises and other alternative business models within Scotland because we recognise the value they bring to communities and to Scotland's employees and, uh, employees and to Scotland's economy as a whole. Thank you. Question number three, Willie Coffey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how its investments built the wider Ayrshire economy. Minister Ivan McKee. The uh, transformational £103 million Scottish Government investment in the Ayrshire Growth Deal supports projects identified as having the greatest potential for long-term inclusive growth. Regional partnerships have, uh, partners have estimated that across Ayrshire, the deal will create 7,000 new jobs and unlock an additional £300 million from the private sector. Projects included will transform the regional economy through high-value job creation, strong regional supply chains, tackling weak productivity and delivering skills across 
Air Star additionally, Air Star has benefited from investment from a range of regeneration programmes supporting development and delivery of local solutions to tackling poverty and disadvantage in communities across Air Star. Willie Coffey. Thank the Minister for that answer. Could you confirm that the investments made by this SNP government are making a positive impact to the Ayrshire economy, in particular at Presswick Airport, where the financial intervention has saved many jobs directly, saved even more jobs in the wider economy, and will support the potential for thousands more jobs across Ayrshire in association with the Ayrshire Growth Team? Minister. Uh, without our intervention in 2013, Presswick Airport would have closed and, as a result, hundreds of jobs uh, would have been lost that were otherwise saved by our, our, our action at that time. We were clear that closure would have a significant impact on the local economy, not just because of jobs lost in the airport, but in the various other businesses that rely on the airport being operational. Our investment through the growth deal projects include in, uh, around, included in and around Presswick Airport will be £30 million over the course of the deal. Four space and aerospace projects will benefit from this investment, and these projects will deliver significant economic benefits, playing a key role in signalling uh, Presswick as a major inward investment destination to the international uh, space market. Regional partners have estimated that across the deal, over 7,000 new jobs were created as a result of the deal. Uh, and within Presswick, that uh, hub, that number is expected to be over 2,700 direct, indirect and construction jobs. Thank you. Pre supplementary, Sharon Dowie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In a letter to the Scottish Government, the Ayrshire Economic Joint Committee notes that projects in the Ayrshire Growth Deal have seen an increase in cost since the projects went to tender. They write that contingency funds may be required by councils for some projects, but budget pressures may make this impossible. What funding will the Scottish Government provide and will it guarantee all projects they are involved in will be fully funded and delivered on time? As briefly as possible, Minnie. Uh, the, the Member will be aware that uh, the growth deal money is obviously, the, some of that money has obviously been agreed between the, the governments and working with local partners to direct how those funds are spent. We are clearly well aware, uh, as the whole economy is of uh, ongoing cost pressures uh, within, the procure, uh, within the construction sector and other sectors. Uh, and, uh, the Scottish Government procurement team uh, are, are working hard to, uh, to do what they can to mitigate that, provide advice to, um, and, and support where possible to uh, partners uh, across the public sector that are facing those uh, ongoing cost challenges. Question number four, Jim Fairley. Thank you, President Officer. I would like to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on any safety issues on the trunk road network in my constituency of Perthshire, South and Kenrosha. Mr Jenny Goldruth. The trunk road network in Scotland is subject to an annual road safety review based on statistics recorded by Police Scotland. And measures are then prioritised where they are expected to contribute to the Scottish Government's 2030 casualty reduction targets. This process has identified road safety investigations on the A85, A9 and the M90, which are currently underway. Those consider trends of recorded injury accidents, as well as focusing on vulnerable groups such as motorcyclists. Any recommendations for improvement work, such as signing, resurfacing and speed management emerging from these, will be considered and prioritised for construction as appropriate. Tim Fairley. I uh, thank the Minister for that uh, answer. The Minister may be aware that there is a growing community concern about the planned new junction on the A9 at Shinafoot, east of Ochterarder. Residents have got concerns about road safety and speeding issues, the locations of the proposed junction and the fact that it appears to have been scaled back from a two-way to a one-way system. Will the Minister agree to meet with me on site to discuss the concerns with local representatives? Minister. I thank the member for his supplementary question. I am aware that the Shinnefoot Junction proposals are intended to support developments identified in the Perth and Kinross Local Development Plan and that those address junction issues that would otherwise exist on the A9. Now, the design of any new junction on the A9 would, of course, be subject to a safety audit and other design checks. I, I recognise that, as Mr Fraley has outlined, concerns have been raised by the members of the community he represents, and as I understand it, those mainly relate to um, roads, local roads access to existing communities and new developments. Uh, I would, of course, be more than happy to meet with Mr Fraley on site and with members of the community that he represents, because it is absolutely essential that we get road safety improvements right for the communities that they serve. Thank you. Question number five and question number six uh, have been withdrawn. Question number seven, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action is taken to increase the number of jobs in offshore wind and the wider green economy. Minister Lorna Slater. I uh, thank the member for the question. The Scottish Government is determined to maximise the economic opportunity for the Scottish supply chain from our offshore wind potential. We will drive forward offshore wind skills development, working with stakeholders to focus on the opportunities for diversification and skills transfer from our oil and gas sector, in line with our commitment to a just transition. 
The introduction of Scotland's supply chain development statements de demonstrates how serious the Scottish Government is about holding developers to account if they do not honour their supply chain commitments and create green jobs. Brian Whittle. Thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, to make the most of opportunities in development of the green economy, we must ensure that our education system uh, produces skills, a skilled workforce appropriate for future jobs. We missed that boat with the development of onshore wind. We now have opportunities with offshore wind, hydrogen and electric power and all the associated servicing skills. So I can ask what the Scottish Government are doing to embed the green economy into the education system. Minister Lonesley. I thank the member for the question. I think it's not easy to overstate, it really can't be overstated, how, what an enormous opportunity Scotwind is. 25 gigawatts is a number that doesn't mean much to many people, but it is huge. Uh, the Scotland leasing round will provide a strong pipeline of projects through this decade and beyond. And to prepare our workforce for these skills, we have the Future Skills Development Plan and the Climate Emergency Skills Action Plan. It is absolutely vital that we equip the people of Scotland, young people coming up the way, people transitioning from high carbon industries, and people returning to work with the skills that they need. Our national strategy for economic transformation commits to lifelong learning for all people of Scotland and the appropriate skills development we need for the Green Industrial Revolution. Please supplementary, Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, given the importance of transitioning from oil and gas to green energy, such as offshore wind, this is a matter of great importance to businesses and residents in Aberdeen South and North Kincardine, my constituency, and the wider North East. Can I ask the Minister how the Scottish Government is engaging with North East employers in the energy sector, particularly with this week being Scottish Apprenticeship Week, to ensure support is in place to train apprentices, apprentices and reskill existing employees. As briefly as possible, Minister. Uh, I thank the member for the question. Of course, the North East has enormous potential not only in offshore wind, but in green hydrogen. And looking at the Scottish ports and the opportunities in Aberdeen in this, in this respect in particular, the Scottish Government is completely committed to supporting the North East through the energy transition, and that includes with skills development. Very brief supplementary, Mercedes Alba. Thank you. Um, the Scottish Government previously promised to deliver 130,000 green jobs by 2020, but just a sixth of that number have been delivered. Latest figures reveal that the number of green jobs is now falling, with a loss of nearly 3,000 since 2014. So will the Scottish Government support Labour's call for the £700 million from the Scotwind licence and all annual income to be ring-fenced for investment in the creation of green jobs? Minister. Applicants to the Scotland leasing round were required to submit a supply chain development statement setting out the anticipated level and location of supply chain impact, including jobs. Developers can update their statements throughout the development phase. The introduction of this statement demonstrates how serious the Scottish Government is about holding developers to account if they do not support their supply chain commitments. And we fully expect developers and OEMs to be engaging with domestic supply chain to create green jobs and to fulfil their commitments. Thank you. In question number eight, Graham Simpson. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how the country's transport system can help to improve economic growth. Minister Jenny Goldruth. Of the National Transport Strategy, we have a vision for a sustainable, inclusive, safe, and accessible transport system, helping deliver a healthier, fairer, and more prosperous Scotland for communities, businesses, and visitors. All of our investment in transport aligns with this vision, as we have set out in the second Strategic Transport Projects Review. By focusing investment on sustainable transport options and continuing to invest in green innovation, we are making Scotland more accessible for residents, visitors and businesses and supporting Scotland's workforce. Graham Simpson. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? Last week's so-called National Strategy for Economic Transformation said of the country's transport network that there remains opportunities to improve connections within and between certain areas and it said of the trunk road network that it's a crucial facilitator for national and local delivery of goods. So given that, um, is the minister uh, now prepared to break free of the shackles of the extremist Greens and commit to properly, properly funding improvements on the A77, A75, A83, A9 and A96? Minister, minister Jenny Galruth. 
thank Mr Simpson for his supplementary question. I remind him that since 2007 this government has invested approximately £9.5 billion in managing, maintaining and improving Scotland's trunk road and motorway network. And the £3 billion investment to dual, of course, the A9 between Perth and Inverness is one of the biggest transport infrastructure projects in Scotland's history. Now, to his substantive point regarding the, economic, uh, the National Strategy for Economic Transformation, uh, it sets out the priorities for Scotland's economy as well as the actions needed to maximise, of course, the opportunities of the next decade to achieve our vision of a well-being economy. And Scotland's transport network has been identified as a key driver to help achieve the ambitions and that vision outlined in the Refresh Strategy. He will also be aware that the recently announced Strategic Transport Projects Review 2 is highlighted as a means to improve connectivity and infrastructure, which he touched upon. And uh, the STPR2 is currently out for public consultation until April. I'll be very welcome to meet, of course, with Mr Simpson next week, and perhaps we can discuss some of these matters uh, in more detail. And a very brief supplementary, Fiona Hislop. The Minister will be aware of the reopening of the Bathgate Airdrie line, which has brought great economic and social benefits to my constituency and right across central Scotland. Can the Minister identify how many transport projects the Scottish Government has invested in? Because I'm sure, like me, Graeme Simpson will want to welcome them all and the economic contribution they have made. Minister, and bear in mind you can write with further detail. Minister. Officer, Ms Hislop is absolutely right to highlight the huge investment this SNP government has made in transport infrastructure. For rail alone, we have invested £1 billion, including £300 million on the Air J to Bathgate rail link improvement, which brought three new stations and a 31% increase in the number of passengers at existing stations, investments in electrification of all rail routes between Edinburgh and Glasgow, and to Stirling, Alloa and Dunblane. Thank you very much indeed, Minister. That concludes uh, general questions and will be a slight pause before we move to the next item of business. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Presiding off the Russian war against Ukraine began. Yesterday, the tragic events hit a new low, with a children's hospital being reduced to rubble. Russians bombed a hospital and they targeted children. Young, innocent lives have been lost in the most despicable and atrocious way. It is hard to express the anger and grief that we all feel at this appalling act. I had the honour of being in the UK Parliament on Monday to hear President Zelensky address the Chamber. He spoke then of 50 children already having died in this war. Following yesterday's bombing, more young lives have been lost because of the actions of Putin and his forces. The people of Ukraine are all in our thoughts and prayers just now. And finally, I know we all agree that more needs to be done to help refugees escaping war, and that needs to happen now. This situation has to be urgently addressed because those who are fleeing for their lives need the safety and security here in the United Kingdom and we have to do everything we can to support them. Can I ask the First Minister, in light of Russia's actions, will the Scottish Government update its energy strategy to outline how they plan to protect our energy security? First Minister. Uh, firstly, Presiding Officer, um, all of us are horrified and deeply distressed uh, by what we are witnessing unfold in Ukraine, not just on a daily basis, but on an hourly basis. And yesterday's developments uh, were a new low, a low that I believe all of us hoped we would never see the, the targeting of children and babies in a maternity hospital. Uh, Vladimir Putin is committing on a daily basis crimes against international law. He is committing crimes against humanity. He is committing war crimes. It is important uh, to do everything uh, that is possible uh, to stop uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, but it is also important to ensure uh, that he pays the severest price uh, for the actions that he is undertaking and the crimes he is committing now. Um, on refugees, can I uh, say, uh, firstly, that I welcome uh, the limited movement that we've heard this morning from the Home Secretary. Um, I think it needs to go further. Um, I repeat my appeal to the Prime Minister to emulate the example of the Republic of Ireland of countries across the European Union uh, to waive visa requirements, to put sanctuary first 
and people work uh, second. Um, I intend to write to the Prime Minister again later today uh, to make that call again. And I would welcome uh, the signatures of Douglas Ross, Anna Sarwar and Alec Cole Hamilton uh, on that letter. And I will liaise with their offices uh, later uh, today. Um, these are important matters. Um, although uh, refugee entry is a reserved matter, uh, let me also be clear that the Scottish Government is actively working with COSLA, with councils, with the Scottish Refugee Council to make sure that we are ready uh, and able to welcome refugees here from Ukraine um, and give them the support uh, that they need. Um, Moving on, presenting officer, to the question uh, that Douglas Ross has posed. As he knows, uh, the Scottish Government is in the process of updating our energy strategy. Uh, that work commenced prior uh, to the horror uh, in Ukraine that is now unfolding. Uh, but of course, the situation in Ukraine and the implications that has for energy prices, uh, not so much in uh, Scotland or the UK for security of energy supply, since we are not dependent on Russian oil and gas in the way uh, that many other countries, particularly in Europe, are. Uh, but of course, uh, we will all bear the burden of increased prices. So obviously, uh, these developments will now be factored into the work on the energy strategy, um, and that will be published, of course, when that work is complete. Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And on refugees, uh, all week I have been working with uh, colleagues in UK Government to see what more can be done. And I do welcome uh, the steps that have been taken this morning by the Home Secretary, but I agree more, much more needs to be done to protect people uh, who are fleeing for their lives. Um, the First Minister mentioned the updated energy strategy, but Russia's appalling actions have put a new, renewed focus on energy security. In Scotland, we have the natural resources to protect our own supply, and we have the resources to export to other countries to reduce Europe's dependence on Russian gas. Last night, the former SNP Energy Minister said, and I quote, in principle, we do need more oil and gas. He continued, we need all the oil and gas production we can get. I agree with Fergus Ewing. We can protect Scottish jobs. Patrick Harvey laughs, but we can protect Scottish jobs and we can secure our energy supply. First Minister, surely now is the time to maximise oil and gas production in Scotland using the energy on our own doorstep. First Minister. Please. These are important issues, and in light of what is happening in Ukraine, of course, we have to look carefully at uh, all of these issues. Uh, the work on our energy strategy, as I said, is underway. Uh, that will allow us to properly understand our energy requirements as we make that transition to net zero. Uh, on the issue of exports of oil and gas, of course, uh, I think around 80 per cent of North Sea production is already uh, exported, uh, a fact that I think it is important to bear in mind. Um, it is, of course, the, uh, the case that we need to consider very carefully the implications uh, of the changes, volatility in the energy market right now for us. Let me repeat again, this is not for the UK an issue of security of supply. Uh, only around 3 per cent of our gas supplies and around 8 per cent of our oil and petroleum supplies uh, come from Russia. But we will all bear the burden of global price increases for energy and indeed for food, which is driving inflation uh, and the cost of living. I think it is important, though, that we understand the realities here. And even if, which none of us should do, of course, because the climate crisis has not gone away, but even if we were to put to one side the environmental considerations, Given the timescales and the practicalities involved, it is not credible to suggest that the short-term solution to this crisis uh, lies in increasing North Sea production. Existing fields in the North Sea are not currently operating under capacity. Expanding existing fields uh, is possible, but that would take months, if not years, and new fields take years, if not decades, to plan and develop. Uh, so we should not go after solutions that might uh, sound superficially attractive uh, but do not stand uh, scrutiny around the practicalities and the realities. In the short term, what we must see in terms of rises in global prices is action from the Chancellor, substantial and significant action from the Chancellor, to shield households across the UK from that uh, impact, including, uh, as uh, I am hearing uh, from a sedentary position uh, behind me, action on uh, reducing VAT. Yes. Uh, medium to longer term, uh, the reality is, and uh, in fact, I have heard uh, UK ministers make this point, as well as uh, the European Commission make this point uh, in recent days. Medium to longer term, the action the world needs to take to reduce dependence on Russian fossil fuels is exactly the same action that the world needs to take to address the climate emergency. We must accelerate the transition 
away from fossil fuels to renewable and low carbon energy. And that's what the Scottish Government remains focused on. Douglas Ross. First Minister started her answer by saying that she and her Government would look at all of the issues and all of the options, but refused to say, if she agrees with myself and the Scottish Conservatives, that we have to maximise oil and gas production in Scotland at the moment to help with the crisis and the crisis going forward. Because, of course, the First Minister has previously said that no new oil fields should be developed. That is just not a realistic solution. It will simply lead to more imports from other countries. Right now, we purchase £3 billion of oil and gas every year from countries including Russia. If the First Minister is not prepared to move on domestic oil and gas supply, then what are her alternatives? Scottish Conservatives support the increased use of nuclear energy. It is low carbon and it is safe. Should not nuclear be in Scotland's energy mix if we want to stop relying on Russian oil and gas and move to net zero? First Minister. But I think if Douglas Ross had, had listened, as I'm sure he did, what I'm trying to do is explain uh, the practicalities in uh, the short term. Um, it's also worth his quoting uh, my colleagues at me, which is perfectly legitimate. Let me quote one of his uh, colleagues at him. Just uh, from Sunday past, the Energy Secretary, the UK Energy Secretary, Kwasi Kwarteng, he said, and I'm quoting now, for as long as we depend on oil and gas, what, wherever it's from, we are all vulnerable to Putin's malign influence on global markets. Uh, that is true. That is the reality. And Douglas Ross's colleagues recognise that. Perhaps he should as well. But he's right to say uh, what are our solutions and all of us are grappling with what the right, best and deliverable solutions are to this. In the short term, in terms of rising prices, um, I think it is inescapably the case that we need to see a substantial financial intervention from the Chancellor to shield households across the country from the impact of rising inflation. Um, and of course we need to look at our energy mix uh, going forward. But I come back to the, the practical point I was making. Uh, increasing production from the North Sea in the short term is not a practically deliverable solution. You take Campbell, and we disagree uh, perhaps in this chamber uh, on whether Campbell should get the go-ahead, but even if Campbell got the go-ahead, uh, 2026 is when it would first produce any oil, nuclear as well, even if and it's not a position I support for the avoidance of doubt, but even if we were to give the go-ahead to new nuclear energy today, it would be years, if not decades, before any of that came on stream. That's the practical reality. So we need to find the solutions uh, now, and we need to make sure that we are accelerating that transition to renewable and low-carbon energy, because that's the solution to dependence on uh, Russian oil and gas uh, over the medium to long term, but it's also, frankly, the responsible action to take in response to the climate emergency, which, I repeat, has not gone away. It's not gone away, which is why I've mentioned the drive towards net zero in my questions. But we've also got to see the situation has changed fundamentally, not just in months and years, but in recent weeks. The First Minister's position doesn't seem to recognise this new reality. Russia's war has changed the situation, and we have to accept that. Scotland could deal a blow to Vladimir Putin by increasing domestic oil and gas production. We could increase that production now. We could end the need for import for, to import foreign oil and gas and export more to reduce international uh, reliance on Russian energy. It is not the time to be ideological. It is the time to be practical yep. and realistic. Yep. And we have heard that from SNP voices. We have heard that from Fergus Ewing. We have heard that from Ian Blackford. Why don't we hear it from the First Minister? First Minister. I, I'm not being ideological. I'm trying to set out hard, practical reasons why what Douglas Ross is calling for, and I, I recognise because we all feel this desire right now to find the solutions to what is happening on a humanitarian level, uh, even on a, a military level, and in terms of the implications uh, for energy and for inflation and for the impact on all of us. But we don't do anybody any favours if we put forward solutions uh, that don't provide that panacea uh, in the, the short term. And what I've said to Douglas Ross, and he hasn't engaged with this at all, if we were to give the go-ahead to Campbell, for example, 
right now, uh, 2026 would be uh, the earliest it could start producing oil. Uh, with new nuclear, if we were to give the go-ahead today, it would be years, if not decades, uh, before that would come on stream. Uh, so even if I was to agree, and I don't agree on all of these matters, these were the right things to do, they do not offer the solution that Douglas Ross is trying to suggest that they do. And that doesn't do anybody any favours. Instead, we've got to look at what the solutions are. Now, in terms of the immediate term, Financial intervention to shield people from the impact of inflation is essential and necessary. And perhaps we would uh, be better advised to come together in this chamber to call on the Chancellor to do that, to act in the way he acted at the start of the pandemic and provide that assistance. Um, and then to come together to look at every opportunity to accelerate the transition uh, to renewable and low carbon sources of energy. Because the other point Douglas Ross didn't engage in uh, in his uh, latest questions is the quasi quartering uh, quote that I have just shared. As long as we remain dependent uh, on oil and gas, uh, we are all dependent uh, and vulnerable to Putin's malign influence. That is the point. So, yes, let's not be ideological. He's, Douglas Ross is saying to me, let's produce uh, more domestically. I have twice now set out to him the timescales and existing fields are not operating under capacity. So this is about uh, new production, and I've set out the timescales of that. We all want to find the solutions, but let's look at realistic solutions. Um, and let's, uh, I think, avoid uh, the tendency to use this as a way of having a go at each other. Instead, come together and find sensible solutions in the interests of the people we serve. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Officer, can I firstly join other party leaders in expressing our continued solidarity with the people of Ukraine? We all continue to be horrified and heartbroken by the scenes that are rolling on our screens of the tragedies taking place in Ukraine, people suffering, people fleeing, but nothing more heartbreaking than the sight of seeing a maternity unit bombed by Russian forces. Vladimir Putin must fail, but let's also be clear, Vladimir Putin is a war criminal and he must face justice. I want to express just two other points. One, a thank you to all those across Scotland and the UK who continue to donate to the appeals to support the people of Ukraine, but also all those doing collections to try and send supplies to Ukraine. There are frustrations, though, about how those supplies actually get to Ukraine and the neighbouring countries, so I think we all need to do more to encourage free flow of supplies. And the second one is on refugees. I am, this goes beyond party politics. This is about people fleeing war and needing not just sanctuary but home here in Scotland. Uh, and I'm willing to join with every other party leader uh, to make sure we are calling on the Home Secretary and the Home Office to do everything necessary to allow those to flee and make home here in Scotland. Uh, so officer, today my thoughts and the thoughts of everyone in this chamber will also be with the family and friends of Brett McCulloch, uh, Donald Dinney and Christopher Stookbury, who died in the Stonehaven rail crash in 2020. Their deaths were a tragedy, and they were avoidable. This morning's report should shame Network Rail and Carillion. But there are questions for Abellio and the Scottish Government too. The train that was operating on this route was decades old. They were first introduced into service in the mid-70s and didn't comply with safety standards set in 1994. This is what the report says about them today. It is more likely than not that the outcome would have been better if the train had been compliant with modern crashworthiness standards. And it goes on, the damage to the train was very extensive. A significantly higher casualty toll would have been likely if the train had been heavily loaded with passengers. First Minister, why did the government agree to run trains that were over 40 years old and didn't meet modern safety standards? And will you now listen to staff and unions and withdraw them from service? First Minister. Well, firstly, uh, my thoughts are very much uh, today with the family and friends of Donald Dinney, uh, Brett McCulloch and Christopher Stookbury, uh, and indeed all those who were injured and affected uh, by this dreadful crash. Today will be an extremely difficult time for the families of the three men who tragically uh, lost their lives, um, and I think uh, we should all be thinking of them uh, today. Um, this will be of no comfort, I'm sure, to his loved ones, but I think it is important to point out that a key finding of this report is that there was nothing in the way Brett McCulloch was driving the train that caused the accident. He was driving within the rules and within the instruction uh, given uh, to him, and I think it's important to record that uh, today. 
Um, I want to thank the Real Accident Investigation Branch uh, staff for this important work, for their thorough approach and the clarity of findings uh, and recommendations. And it's important now that those recommendations are implemented. Um, it is important in relation to the specific point that Anna Sarwar raises uh, to say, as indeed uh, the report uh, notes, the refurbished high-speed train that derailed uh, was fully compliant with legal requirements to operate. However, since it was designed and constructed, uh, railway standards have continued to improve, reflecting lessons learned uh, from investigations uh, of this type. Uh, the train operator, in this case ScotRail, uh, has the statutory du duty to ensure that the trains they operate are safe. Um, and of course, it's the statutory duty of the Office of uh, Rail and Road as regulator to oversee that duty with enforcement uh, if and when necessary, and the Office of Rail and Road will monitor the work being undertaken to address recommendations uh, of the Rail Accident Investigation Branch. Uh, that duty, of course, will pass to the new publicly owned and controlled ScotRail uh, on the 1st of April. Uh, but, of course, ScotRail at the time of this crash was not uh, owned uh, by the Scottish Government in the way that it will be. In future, I think the final point that it is uh, important to make, uh, presiding officer, is that while this report uh, is important, uh, very important, in fact, it will not be the last uh, report into this tragic uh, incident. There is a further report being undertaken uh, by the Office of Rail and Road, uh, and that's a joint investigation with Police Scotland and the British Transport Police, and that will report to the Procurator Fiscal later this year. And that will allow prosecutors to consider questions of criminal prosecutions and a fatal accident inquiry. However, these, of course, are matters for the Lord Advocate. Anna Sarwar. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I think it's safe to say that we shouldn't have allowed uh, unsafe trains or trains that didn't meet standards to be on our railways. And I would hope when we do have uh, under public ownership that that is uh, corrected immediately. Uh, Prairie officer, three families have been failed. Staff are continuing to be failed because they're being asked to operate on trains that don't meet safety standards. I again repeat, set in 1994. We know that Network Rail plans have plans to make over 2,000 staff redundant across the UK. That is unacceptable. The Scottish Government, which takes ownership of ScotRail in a few weeks, is still refusing to rule out compulsory redundancies here in Scotland. Let's not forget these are workers who kept, going, kept us going during the pandemic, and we can't have a safe railway if we don't have a properly staffed railway too. So in light of today's report, will the First Minister commit to no compulsory redundancies? And failing that, will she at least commit to no compulsory redundancies in safety critical roles on Scotland's railway? First Minister. Uh, firstly, can I, I repeat that all of our thoughts are with uh, the families who have lost uh, loved ones. This was uh, a tragedy um, and nothing that any of us can say, nothing that any report uh, can say will remove uh, or lessen the pain that they are going through. But it is important that uh, lessons are learned uh, from any tragic incident like this, and it's important that that will be the case uh, here as well. In terms of the train, uh, I, I won't repeat what I've already said uh, in that regard, but it is important, I think, just to underline this point that uh, the accident, according to this report, was caused by a failure of the infrastructure, uh, not the train, which was confirmed to have been properly licensed and approved to operate. Uh, albeit uh, I would refer back to the comments I made earlier. In terms of the transfer of ScotRail to public ownership, something that I am very proud that this Government is undertaking, um, we will of course continue to negotiate with the unions around all of these matters, as uh, I think would be expected of us, um, and I will not preempt uh, any of that. But what I will say is that this Government has a very, very strong record of no compulsory redundancies. Uh, within uh, those agencies uh, that we have responsibility for. Uh, I think that commitment is important. Uh, I think that commitment is important across uh, a whole range of our responsibilities um, and the principles that have guided us uh, to date uh, will continue to guide us uh, as we take over uh, ownership uh, and responsibility for ScotRail next month. Anna Sarwar. I think the real unions would welcome an unequivocal confirmation from the First Minister that there will be no compulsory redundancies, particularly those in safety critical roles. Despite this report today, there are still uh, unanswered questions. Uh, and we can't allow this to be a report where uh, people say one words but no meaningful action follows. Uh, the First Minister is right, we still have criminal investigations to conclude. Uh, there remain questions about the standard of trains uh, and the levels of staffing. But what we must never forget is that the heart of this are victims and families who have been failed by a powerful corporation and public bodies, and they shouldn't have to wait years to get answers. We can't allow this to become yet another in a long line of public scandals and tragedies in Scotland, 
where no one is held to account and where institutions protect themselves rather than the public. As Kevin Lindsay from ASLEF, the train drivers union, said, we must do everything we can to bring those responsible for this catastrophic event to justice. Will the First Minister do the same? First Minister. Um, can I firstly say I have read Aslev's comments this morning. I totally understand them um, I, and I understand uh, without hesitation uh, how strongly, why uh, they feel as strongly about this report and its findings. Uh, the real family in Scotland, as it is in, in many countries, is a very close-knit one. Uh, they've lost one of their own in this tragedy and I absolutely understand uh, why they're making the comments that they are making. I think it's important, though, to stress this point. I, Anna Sarwar it poses these questions rightly to me, but it's important to stress the independence of these investigations. And it is important to repeat, and Anna Sarwar has acknowledged this, that the report today, it's not just that it's not the final report, uh, the remit of the real accident investigation branch is to investigate these incidents on a no blame basis. So it is not there to apportion uh, blame, it's there uh, to establish the facts and that is what it has done. Uh, the further investigation that is underway with the Office of Rail and Road uh, in uh, parallel with Police Scotland and the British Transport Police, uh, that will report to the Procurator Fiscal and then it will be for law officers and the Crown Office to determine whether there should be criminal prosecutions um, or whether indeed there should be a fatal accident inquiry. Um, and of course, that would be the moment, I think, to consider any wider issues of accountability uh, as well. But it would be completely wrong uh, for me to preempt those investigations or to try to curtail those investigations in any way in terms of commenting uh, about the appropriate timescale for that. That uh, latter investigation is due to report, uh, as I understand it, later this year. Uh, the final point I would make, Presiding Officer, um, the comments that have been made about the trains, of course, uh, are for the operating company, that is ScotRail, from the 1st of April. Uh, that will be a publicly owned ScotRail. Uh, but the comments in the report about the infrastructure, and it was a failure uh, in terms of infrastructure, are matters for Network Rail. And I would point out again that uh, Network Rail remains uh, a reserved uh, body, accountable to the UK government, not directly accountable to this government. Railway safety is also uh, reserved. And perhaps one of the wider, longer term lessons we will want to reflect on in this parliament uh, is whether that uh, is right uh, or whether we could come together as a parliament um, and make the case for that to change so that we can have devolution uh, not just of the, the operation of the railway, but of the infrastructure uh, that it operates on as well. Uh, so there's lots of lessons uh, to learn here, and uh, I'm certainly committed to making sure that I do everything possible to ensure that they are learned. Thank you. Take some supplementaries, and I call CoCab Stewart. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. When talking about emergency visa waivers at Westminster yesterday, the Ukrainian ambassador to the UK told the Home Affairs Committee that at particular times, drastic measures should be taken. I believe something like dropping everything could be considered as well. In the light of that direct plea from the ambassador to, of uh, our war-ravaged European neighbours, does the First Minister agree the UK Government should adopt the position of the Irish Government where all visa barriers have been removed to allow refugees to be welcomed quickly, safely and securely without delay and post-arrival paperwork and biometric work is uh, conducted in concert with the Ukrainian Consul so arrivals can securely settle anywhere across the UK's common travel area? First Minister. Uh, yes, I, I do. I, I strongly support that position, um, and that is the position that has been adopted by the Republic of Ireland and by countries across the European Union. Um, I spoke uh, myself to uh, a Ukrainian uh, living here in Scotland, uh, a man who lives in Glasgow. Uh, I spoke to him yesterday, uh, and this will be one of many, many stories. Uh, he spoke to me about the efforts to get his family members, uh, his sister in particular, to this country. She had managed to get uh, to Poland after uh, an arduous journey and the wall of bureaucracy uh, that met her in trying then to get to the UK was, was mind-boggling um, and inhumane uh, in the circumstances. Now, I, I welcome, as I said earlier on, uh, the movement we appear to have heard from Priti Patel in the Home Office this morning. Uh, as I understand it, and I, I'm still, uh, when I came to the Chamber, was still trying to absorb all of the details of it. As I understand it, uh, Ukrainians uh, with a, a Ukrainian passport uh, will be able now uh, to apply for a visa but only through the family uh, route, which is the only route open right now, online, rather than have to go to uh, a visa application centre. That is movement, uh, and I understand that for them, the biometric processes will be completed when uh, they come to the UK. 
but it is still requiring a visa application process, and that is not good enough. Uh, we need to waive that process, allow people to get here, um, and then do the paperwork after that. That is not just the humanitarian thing to do, that is what other countries are doing as well. Finally, Presiding Officer, we hope we will have confirmation uh, over the next couple of days from the UK Government of the opening of the community sponsorship route. Uh, that has been overseen by Michael Gove uh, rather than the Home Office. I have had constructive discussions with Michael Gove in the last uh, couple of days about this. The Scottish Government has put a proposition uh, to him and his officials that would allow the Scottish Government, in partnership with the Scottish Refugee Council, with COSLA, effectively to run that scheme here in Scotland so that we can make sure uh, people coming through it get the right support, because I think the vast majority of people in Scotland want to welcome them with open arms. And that is what we uh, are intent on doing, if we possibly can if the UK government procedures allow us to do so. Rachel Hamilton. Scottish Borders Council papers reveal that the Scottish Government seek removal of any indication of a preferred route for a borders rail extension from Tweed Bank to Carlisle via Hoyk. Can the First Minister give my constituents assurances that the SNP Government will not derail the project and the route will go via Newcastleton? First Minister. Um, as I understand it, as I recall, this is, uh, these are matters that are being looked at in terms of the borderlands uh, deal. Uh, we want to encourage uh, the greatest possible uh, connectivity and uh, to get the greatest possible benefits uh, from the borders uh, rail link and any extension from that. I'll ask the Transport Minister uh, to write in greater detail um, about the processes that will be followed. Jackie Bailey. On Christmas Eve, IVF treatment was suspended across Scotland for women who were not up to date with their COVID vaccinations. Scotland was the only part of the UK to do so, and it was the only service in the NHS on which treatment was conditional on vaccination. The Chief Medical Officer announced that the service would resume last week, which is welcome. However, women arriving for IVF treatment were sent away because a consent form from the Scottish Government's central legal office had not yet been processed. This is causing a continuing delay to treatment, which is reducing the chances of women falling pregnant. Will the First Minister intervene to ensure that IVF treatment is not delayed any further? First Minister. Well, firstly, it's really important to stress uh, that the recommendation to temporarily defer fertility treatment for women not fully vaccinated was taken uh, as a clinical uh, decision in response to emerging evidence and clinical concerns uh, raised by lead clinicians in the four NHS-assisted conception units uh, about the risk to mothers and uh, babies uh, of not being vaccinated. These concerns were based on patient safety, um, and the decision affected a small number of patients, although I understand uh, the distress and trauma uh, that will have uh, been caused. But for the vast majority of women, treatment was uh, able to proceed without delay. Uh, the Chief Medical Officer is now recommending that fertility treatment for unvaccinated patients uh, no longer uh, needs to be deferred. Uh, that is a decision that will be given immediate effect so that treatment of patients can uh, recommence. The issue, the administrative issue that Jackie Bailey is raised, uh, I am not aware of, but I will look into that uh, and make sure that if that is an issue uh, that subsists, that it is rectified as soon as possible. Question number three, Ariane Burgess. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government will do to mitigate the impact of volatile gas prices. First Minister. Uh, rising gas prices are causing uh, many people uh, to worry about energy bills, uh, especially, of course, with the price cap increase uh, coming in April. Um, alongside a wider package of cost of living support, the Scottish Government is providing a further £10 million for our fuel insecurity fund uh, to ensure support remains available for people at risk of self-disconnecting uh, or severely rationing their energy use. However, energy markets are reserved, uh, so we must uh, and do urge the UK Government to do much more, significantly more now, to support consumers. Um, and that should uh, include uh, a cut uh, to VAT on energy. Uh, longer term, uh, the gas price surge, as I was uh, reflecting earlier, reinforces the need to end our dependence on fossil fuels and accelerate the green transition, uh, something that the European Commission and indeed UK government ministers have also been calling for this week. Ariane Burgess. The First Minister for her response. The Conservatives have shamelessly used the Russian invasion of Ukraine as an excuse to further expand fossil fuel production. Indeed, Douglas Ross has just called for the Scottish Government to ignore climate science and ramp it up. 
Not only does this dismiss the advice of the UN, the International Energy Agency and the Climate Change Committee, but it also contradicts the integrated review of security, defense, development and foreign policy, which states that ensuring the supply of secure, affordable and clean energy is essential to the UK's national interests. Isn't it the case that the best way that we can promote peace and security tackle fuel poverty and secure our energy supply is by redu reducing our reliance on gas through the net zero building strategy and by supporting a scaling up of renewable energy. First Minister. Uh, yes, I, I, I do agree with that. I'm not going to repeat all the points I made in response to Douglas Ross. Uh, however, while I don't agree uh, with the UK government in all of uh, these matters, uh, these are uh, arguments that are being made uh, by UK government ministers as well. Um, anybody who thinks uh, that the horror in Ukraine, uh, while of course um, it is taking all of our attention rightly at the moment, it means that the climate crisis has gone away. You need only read uh, the IPCC uh, latest report published uh, last week. It has not. Indeed, the impacts of climate breakdown uh, are accelerating, and we have a duty uh, to take that uh, extremely seriously. Um, we have to accelerate the transition uh, to clean sources of energy. That is right for the sake of the planet, but it is also right in terms of uh, wider issues of energy security as well. So we've all got to focus on doing that, uh, and that, of course, is what the Scottish Government is doing. Douglas Lumsden. Uh, thank you. Um, Fergus, you and MSP has said that voluntary ceasing exploration in the North Sea would actually increase Scotland's carbon footprint by making it more reliant on fossil fuels from other countries. Alan Smith has said that it's a legitimate question whether North Sea oil and gas production should be extended amid the war in Ukraine. And Ian Blackford has pointed out that we can bring maximum pressure to be felt by Putin by cutting off Western demand for Russian oil. Does the First Minister recognise that support for her opposition to further North Sea exploration is now crumbling within her own party and that it's time to change course? First Minister. Members, members of my party are engaging in an intelligent way about these issues, which I think is incumbent on all of us to do. And in terms of uh, Ian Blackford's comment, we should cut off uh, demand for Russian oil and gas. For as long as states or companies uh, are buying Russian oil and gas, we are, however, inadvertently helping fund his illegal war and probably in the process prolonging that war. So I call for uh, import bans on Russian oil and gas uh, by uh, states uh, and by countries. I, I welcome the, albeit still limited, action that the UK government uh, announced in this regard earlier this week. But I don't know if Douglas Lumsden was listening to the answers I gave to Douglas Ross. If I was to stand here right now, um, which I'm obviously, I take a different view on some of these things, but even if I was to stand here right now and say, let's increase North Sea uh, production, uh, the timescales and the practicalities of that do not mean that that offers a solution uh, to the immediate challenges we're facing. I set out in some detail the timescales that would be involved. Uh, Campbell, the one that is... Uh, closest uh, to being given uh, approval potentially by the, the UK government, 2026 would be the earliest that it started producing oil. So let's not uh, grasp at uh, false solutions. Instead, let's focus on our obligations. Oil and gas is part of our energy mix right now. It's going to continue to be part of our energy mix uh, during the transition. It is important to recognise that, but existing fields are not operating under capacity. Uh, but we must now focus on that transition, on making sure it's a just transition, that we're investing in the alternative, that we're protecting the jobs, because that's in the interest uh, not just of helping defeat Putin, but of ensuring energy security and also protecting our planet. Mercedes de Alba. Thank you. Um, research from Energy Action Scotland shows that nearly 40% of households will no longer be able to afford to heat their own homes adequately due to rising energy prices. Yet the Scottish Government have rode back on their promise to create a publicly owned energy company despite the outline business case showing it would have produced annual savings for customers. So I'm seeking some clarity from the First Minister. Does she believe, as I do, that essential resources like energy must be available to everyone on the basis of need, not ability to pay? First Minister. We set out before uh, the position in terms of a publicly owned energy company, uh, why uh, we changed uh, our, our pre-existing position and uh, what we uh, are focused on delivering now. I'm not going to rehearse uh, all of that today. 
Uh, but I, I do agree uh, that energy is not uh, a luxury. People you know, have to be able to heat their homes. Uh, that is why it's so important now uh, that we are doing everything we can within our powers and resources to help people with that. Uh, but these matters uh, still remain largely reserved to the UK Government and therefore it is incumbent on all of us uh, to ask the Chancellor to take the requisite action uh, that we need to see uh, right now. Uh, Labour, I can understand why the Tories might be groaning at that answer. I really don't understand why Labour, because they're exactly the same arguments uh, that Labour's colleagues uh, in London are making right now. The Chancellor must step up and act to protect households, the length and breadth of the country. Uh, we are calling for that. The uh, question and the mystery is why uh, Labour are so, so upset by the fact that we are calling for that action. Question number four, Bob Doris. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the MND Scotland report, no time to lose, addressing the housing needs of people with MND, which highlights the barriers faced by people with MND in securing adaptations or accessible homes. First Minister. I welcome the report produced by MND Scotland and recognise that more uh, needs to be done to ensure people with degenerative illnesses such as MND have choice, dignity and freedom to access suitable homes. Uh, we know there are issues with the way adaptations are being accessed and delivered locally and are considering how the process can be streamlined and made easier for people who need adaptations. We're also working, of course, to increase the supply of accessible and adapted homes and, wherever possible, all new affordable homes are designed to be flexible to meet people's needs as they change over time. We're also delivering a programme to retrofit homes in the social rented sector to make them more accessible. Bob Doris. I thank the First Minister for that answer. The report tells of one man who was being washed on his decking because the family were away to accessible shower facilities. And the, and the average life expectancy with MND is just 18 months from diagnosis. Some will never get the adaptations that they need. As the report rightly states, people with MND should be making precious memories with friends and family the time they have left, not fighting for the adaptations and accessible homes they urgently need. Will the Scottish Government meet MND Scotland to discuss the recommendations and do all it can, in collaboration of course with partners in local government, to ensure that people with MND can live in accessible homes with the care and dignity that everyone is entitled to? First Minister. Uh, well, of course, uh, we want everyone, uh, particularly at a time in their life when they're living with uh, ill health or a condition such as MND, uh, to be given the support they need to be able to live in their own home uh, and have their own home suitable for them and for their needs. As I said a moment ago, I know that the adaptation system requires improvement and I recognise the particular need for speed for those with MND. Um, I, or indeed the Housing Secretary, would of course be happy to meet with MND Scotland as we take forward the review of the adaptations process uh, to listen to their views um, and of course hear more about their report and recommendations. Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Last night, the Glasgow Film Festival premiered a film about a man with MND, Adi Bartman, and his activism. I commend it to all across the chamber. At present, only 1% of housing is fully accessible for wheelchair users. Around 10,000 disabled people are on waiting lists. And I have constituents, disabled people, who have waited over six years for, accessible, for an accessible home. Does the First Minister agree with me that this is unacceptable? And what urgent action will the Scottish Government take to meet disabled people's housing needs? First Minister. I do think more action is needed. I have uh, already made that point. Um, in 2021, uh, 2021, 95% uh, of new build homes delivered by housing associations and councils uh, where information was returned uh, on housing for varying needs uh, met the standards uh, set out in those accessibility standards, but there is much more uh, needs to be done across uh, all tenures of housing. Uh, we're currently reviewing the housing for varying needs uh, design guide. Uh, that is a good standard, but it is now over 20 years old. Um, we have also flexible grant funding arrangements in place, ensuring that specialist housing provision um, identified by local authorities as a priority can be supported. Uh, so we will continue to focus on uh, all of these issues, and uh, I have already recognised how important they are uh, for everybody who has particular needs, uh, but particularly those uh, living with conditions like MND. And I uh, will make a point of uh, looking and watching uh, the film uh, that Pam Duncan Glancy has brought to my attention. Question number five, Donald Cameron. Uh, to ask the First Minister whether she will provide an update on the spring rollout of the COVID-19 booster vaccine. 
First Minister. Vaccination, of course, remains a critical component in our COVID response. Uh, to date, 86.3 per cent of eligible people aged 18 and over have received a third or booster uh, dose of vaccine uh, in Scotland. And indeed, we continue to deliver the highest vaccine delivery rates anywhere in the UK. Uh, we welcome the JCVI's recommendation to offer some of the most vulnerable groups an additional vaccine dose in spring of this year. Indeed, from the start of this week, we began the process of uh, initially delivering this within care homes and also started to invite all of those who are now eligible for their additional uh, booster. These vaccinations will continue over the next few months um, as these individuals become eligible, uh, and that is when they reach six months uh, from the date of their last dose. Uh, we continue to act on JCVI advice and are planning for a number of different scenarios, including an annual booster programme for those most at risk. Donald Cameron. Uh, the First Minister will recall that during the previous vaccine booster campaign, there were several issues with the rollout in the Highlands and Islands, uh, including incorrect details on letters going out to the public in terms of where people should go to get their booster. Given this spring campaign is targeted at the most vulnerable groups in society, what action has the Scottish Government taken to prevent such mistakes happening again? First Minister. Uh, we have had engagement and dialogue with NHS Highland about uh, the experience previously, and I would hope that would not be repeated. Um, it is important, though, uh, to point out uh, that NHS Highland uptake uh, amongst JCVI priority groups has generally been very good, uh, particularly amongst care home residents, with 98 per cent having received a booster or third dose. So the delivery uh, rollout has gone well, but of course uh, we do take action to ensure that any administrative difficulties um, are learned from and not repeated. And that's the case with NHS Highland and any other health board. Christine Graham. Thank you very much, presiding officer. While welcoming the programme for rollout of boosters in the spring, I declare an interest I might be lucky enough to be in one of the cohorts. With the potential removal of mandatory face coverings and social distancing and the increasing prevalence of COVID infections, does the First Minister agree with me that lateral flow tests should remain funded and free in request? And what discussions has the Scottish Government had with the UK Treasury in this regard? First Minister. Uh, well, given that I uh, know the uh, age uh, at which we are offering these additional boosters right now, I'm too scared to suggest whether or not Christine Graham is likely to be included in uh, these groups. Um, so I, I think I'll err on the side of caution um, on that front. Um, in terms of testing, it's an important issue. We are, as I set out in the Chamber a couple of weeks ago, we're developing a managed transition plan uh, to ensure that Scotland continues to have an effective, albeit proportionate, testing response and an effective surveillance infrastructure. Um, access to PCR and lateral flow tests will continue to be supported throughout the transition phase and lateral flow tests will remain free of charge for any purpose that we continue to advise uh, that testing is required. Um, the Health Secretary and I have been in regular dialogue with the UK Government about the future of the UK testing programme, but unfortunately still don't have clarity on the impact to Scottish Government funding. Uh, but we continue to engage urgently with them to gain this clarity, and I hope we will do so soon. Thank you. Question six has been withdrawn. I will take a couple of supplementaries if they are brief, and I call Alistair Allen. The First Minister will be aware that Tyne and Chigal the housing agency in the Western Isles last week announced it would no longer be able to administer government-funded insulation projects, not for any lack of funding, but because of PAS 2035 regulations on ventilation, which have caused demand for such schemes to collapse in the islands. Given that the Western Isles is almost certainly one of the most fuel-poor communities in Europe, what can the Scottish Government do to urgently ensure that these vital insulation installations can continue? First Minister. Um, firstly, um, I understand that uh, what is a, a new UK-wide uh, set of retrofit standards have created uh, challenges in the Western Isles. Over the past week, we have followed this up uh, with the housing provider and the Council to restate our commitment to finding a solution that enables them to continue to improve the warmth and ventilation of people's homes. I know Dr Allen has raised this issue before today, and I, I believe he has received a copy of the most 
recent correspondence. Officials are also working with the British Standards Institution to further improve the new retrofit standards to ensure circumstances in remote, uh, rural and island communities are taken fully into uh, account. Uh, we value the housing work done in the Western Isles and uh, hope uh, that uh, the issue can be reconsidered uh, now in light of our further discussions uh, and we will continue uh, to see that expertise applied in the Western Isles. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, Clackmannanshire out of our GP service is in crisis. Assurances were sought regarding this late last year, and reassurance was given by the local MSP and the council group leader that NHS Forth Valley remained committed to providing services in Clackmannanshire. The service, despite the rhetoric, is being eroded. GPs who have been appointed to the service are being told they are no longer required, and the NHS Forth Valley regularly goes into code black. First Minister, this is jeopardising the safety of patients. Therefore, what action can be put in place to maintain, retain and sustain the services for the people of Clackmannanshire? First Minister. Well, this is a really important issue. I am aware of the difficulty being faced by NHS Forth Valley um, and have been assured uh, that they are working hard to continue uh, to provide a service and uh, they remain uh, committed uh, to doing so, and that is important. Uh, the Scottish Government is currently working with NHS Forth Valley to review uh, the service. Uh, this review is in its early stages, but the aim will be to ensure a safe and sustainable service uh, moving forward. Uh, officials are also following up with the Chief Executive as a matter of urgency to identify and secure solutions for the current situation and develop longer-term uh, plans. The Cabinet Secretary, I know, has asked for further details this week on how the Board intends to address these shortages, and I am sure he would be happy to correspond with the Member uh, with further detail when he receives that. Mark Roscoe. Thank you. Today's announcement from the UK Government on the Ukrainian humanitarian scheme is significant, but I agree with the First Minister that it does not go far enough. Ukrainian seasonal workers across Scotland, many of whom are my constituents in Fife, are still barred from bringing their family members to safety and are still subject to the abhorrent no recourse to public funds conditions. So can I ask the First Minister what further support and assistance can the Scottish Government provide to Ukrainian seasonal workers who are still at the harsh end of the UK Government's hostile environment? First Minister. Well, we're trying to influence UK Government decisions uh, on this uh, every day right now. Currently, the only route open for Ukrainians is the, the family reunification scheme. It is still too limited, uh, in my view, uh, but it is also, as we have seen, painfully seen in recent days, horrendously uh, bureaucratic. Uh, we are asking uh, for that to be streamlined. We are asking for visa requirements to be waived, but we are also seeking assurances, and I hope these assurances uh, will be given, uh, that people coming here, uh, whether they come under that route or the community sponsorship route that I hope will open in the next few days, will be able to work, will have access to public funds, and that the Scottish Government will be able to work with our partners to ensure full support uh, for everybody who comes here. So these are the discussions we continue to pursue uh, with the UK Government, and I hope uh, it should not uh, take this, and no country right now should have to be shamed into doing right by refugees. It is appalling that this is the case, but I hope we do get to a position uh, where we are, as I said the other day, not just opening our hearts uh, to people in Ukraine, I think we have all done that, but we are opening our doors as well, allowing people to come here and then ensuring that they have the support they need to recover from their trauma and to try to rebuild some uh, lives while we are all hoping for peace in their own country. And Willie Rennie. Jack McKenzie, Katie Allen, William Lindsay, Robert Wagstaff and Liam Kerr. These five young people took their lives, their own lives, at Polmont, all within the last five years. The Children and Young Persons Commissioner believes that the conditions for children in prison were in breach of the UNCRC and the prohibition on torture, inhuman and degrading treatment or punishment in terms of Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights. How many more damning reports will be published? How many more young people will have to die before this shameful situation comes to an end? First Minister. Can I make very clear, Presiding Officer, we fully support uh, a presumption against any uh, people under the age of 18 being dealt with through uh, the criminal justice system. 
Um, since the shift towards prevention in 2007, there have been positive changes in youth justice. Uh, according to uh, official statistics, um, at uh, 30th of June 2007, there were 221 young people under the age of 18 in custody. As of Tuesday this week, there were 15. Um, between 2008-9 and 2019-20, there was an 85% reduction in the number of children and young people prosecuted in courts and a 93% reduction in 16- and 17-year-olds sentenced to custody. Uh, there is more to do, though. In line with our commitment to keeping the promise, uh, we are committed to reducing this number further. Uh, we all want Scotland's young people to be safeguarded uh, within the youth justice system and kept out of young offenders' institutions. Uh, and we will be consulting shortly on necessary legislative changes uh, to underpin uh, the changes in practice uh, that I have just narrated. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. There will be a brief pause before members' business. What distinguishes Broadcasting Scotland from a website or blog, apart from our brilliant programmes? Hi there, I'm Gordon Ross. Are the costs we face to enable us to produce those programmes? These costs are significant and ongoing. However, our facilities are able to do so much more if only we had the staff. In the last year, some of our supporters have cancelled their subscriptions. In one way, we would prefer it if it was because they didn't like us rather than it being because of the financial pressures which we are all under because of COVID. The really positive outcome of our fundraiser is that at a time of economic challenge in Scotland, we will use your donations to create jobs and in a small way contribute to improving the Scottish economy. If you want us to be Scotland's independent broadcaster, able to provide an alternative mainstream television platform, then please support us. Scotland is going to be an independent country. Just imagine what we could do if we had even 1% of the BBC Scotland Channel's budget. Imagine. And then please consider turning your imagination into reality. Please support us if you can afford it.